I'll just say welcome um, to this morning's webinar on the UK National Security and Investment Act, um, and specifically uh, on lessons learned so far in relation to that. Um, so uh, in terms of an introduction, um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Charles Livingston. I'm a partner in the government regulation and competition team at Brodies, and I head up our competition practice. Um, which is the practice that has responsibility for um, National Security and Investment Act, essentially as a, a kind of species of merger control. Um, and I'm joined today by Jamie Dunn, who is a senior associate in our team um, and has done a lot of work on the NSI, NSIA uh, regime. It'll be a long webinar if I start stumbling over that particular initialism. Um, so our agenda for today, we'll do a bit of a recap of the NSIA regime and what it does, um, then pick out uh, some of the statistics that have been published by the government in terms of the first one and a quarter years of its operation. I'll explain why it's that particular time frame. Um, we'll then recap uh, the interventions that have been made by the government in relation to uh, particular deals. And then we'll cover some of the general lessons, themes and issues from the, the first couple of years of operation of the Act and our experience with it. So to kick off, um, I will just give you a brief reminder of what the Act does. So the, the Act can essentially be broken down into two separate but complementary regimes. The first is a uh, notification regime that is a mandatory regime that requires notification before deals complete uh, in respect of entity acquisitions. So that's where you're actually acquiring uh, uh, a company or uh, an LLP or a partnership or essentially anything that isn't an individual. Um, and if that entity is active in one of 17 key sectors, then uh, has to be notified as long as certain thresholds are met. We'll come back to the key sectors, um, but in terms of the thresholds, those relate to shares, uh, voting rights, vetoes, that sort of thing. Again, we'll break those down a bit more in a moment. Um, there are severe potential penalties um, and uh, other consequences for non-compliance. Um, one point to note is that the regime does include things like group reorganizations, so there doesn't actually need to be a, a change in the ultimate ownership um, of an entity. Um, if there's any, even if there's just a, a sort of formal changing of ownership from one group company to another, then the regime can be triggered. Uh, there's no de minimis turnover or deal value threshold. It's it's it really doesn't uh, doesn't matter how big or small um, the entity in question is, um, and the buyer identity is also irrelevant. Um, it's it's certainly irrelevant to the question of whether you have to notify a deal. Um, it will be relevant to uh, whether the government will actually care about it. Um, but that is that is a second order question. The important thing for the mandatory regime is to make sure that you know whether your deal um, is caught uh, and if it is, make sure you notify it. The second aspect of the Act um, is the, the government's call-in power, which it can use, uh, well, formally it exercises its call-in power if it wants to review um, a notified deal in more detail. But um, for our purposes, the call-in power means uh, it can call in for review entity acquisitions that were not uh, caught by the mandatory notification regime. Um, and that includes if the acquirer is only achieving material influence, as you'll see in a moment. Um, and it also applies to asset deals, um, which has been quite relevant in terms of, and that includes things like licensing. Um, that's been quite relevant in terms of higher education. I know we've got a few attendees from that particular sector on today's webinar. And you'll see when we get to the orders that have been made by the government that there are a couple of examples where um, assets developed by universities, um, where the acquisition of those has been called in um, by the government. Um, a, a deal that isn't covered by the mandatory uh, notification regime um, is going to be at the highest risk of being called in if the entity or the asset in question is closely related to the 17 key sectors, which again, uh, we'll come back to in a moment. Um, but to begin with, uh, what we'll do is we'll cover the uh, the thresholds. So this is for an entity acquisition. Um, and this, uh, this is a screen grab from a flowchart uh, that, that we have developed um, and which we're we're generally happy to share. So you can get in touch with us afterwards if you would find it useful to have this. Um, 
but uh, I, I mentioned that it's a screen grab from a wider document to explain why there are the little footnote numbers in them, because those footnotes explain some of the uh, the concepts um, that are used. Uh, so the, the first question you ask yourself relates to shareholdings or voting rights in the entity. And there are thresholds of 25%, 50%, or 75%. Um, and depending on the threshold, it might be triggered if you land on the number, or it might be triggered if you go above the number. That's one of the things our footnotes are for. Um, but essentially, if uh, if a party um, goes through a threshold, uh, goes through one of those thresholds in terms of their shareholding or voting rights in an entity, um, then you are you're answering yes uh, to that first level of the question uh, of the flowchart. Um, and once you answer yes. Uh, then the next question is whether the target entity falls within the 17 key sectors. And it says, again, it says C over leaf because it's an extract from a longer document. If the target entity does fall within one of the 17 key sectors, then you are into the mandatory notification regime. So there are, there are two aspects um, to uh, checking whether you need to notify. Um, if you can escape through the first question, then that's going to be preferable in most cases because that's going to be, um, in most cases, easier to work out um, than uh, the second question about key sectors. Although there are, as you'll see when we get to that slide, there are um, particular, uh, there will be particular entities where the application of the sectors is going to be pretty obvious. Um, if you're not going through one of those thresholds, then you're into the second question, um, and. We've had quite a lot of discussions internally about when this sort of thing might actually arise. So acquiring voting rights, if a party acquires voting rights that would enable it um, through the exercise of those voting rights and indeed those rights and any other rights it already had to secure or veto any class of resolution governing the affairs of the entity. Um, now, this this uh, has to be uh, in respect of the rights have to be in respect of the shares. So it's not going to cover something like a shareholders agreement where the rights might veto rights are more contractual based. Uh, it's going to be something that you're probably going to find in the articles of the company, for example. And it would maybe cover something like a golden share type of arrangement that allows a party to um, you know, veto uh, any any general or special resolutions. Um, in relation to the entity, despite not having 25 or 50 or 75 percent. Um, I think that's generally in there. Um, uh, having discussed with corporate, uh, our corporate team, we, we kind of think that is um, in there more as an anti-avoidance provision than something that you'll actually see a lot in the real world, um, that uh, it's there so that parties who uh, may be acting in, in bad faith, don't just try and structure their deal so they avoid triggering one of the uh, top level thresholds, but nevertheless give themselves all sorts of power to control um, the affairs of the entity in question. So it's not necessarily something that you're going to see a lot in practice, but it's nevertheless something to be mindful of because it is the other way into the mandatory notification regime. Um, if you don't have either of those things, uh, but you are acquiring material influence, and that's a concept that's pretty well understood from merger control, um, then uh, you don't have mandatory notification, but the deal could still be called in. Um, so if somebody is acquiring material influence over an entity that is uh, that is squarely within one of the 17 key sectors, and in particular, let's say it's a it's a nuclear power plant um, or some other key infrastructure, or it's a core uh, UK defence contractor, something like that, um, then that's a scenario where you might end up in the in the blue box. So you're not talking about mandatory notification, but the deal could still be called in. Um, and if you are in that scenario, then you might consider a, making a voluntary notification. So uh, notifying it to the government um, voluntarily rather than uh, just completing and then waiting to see if the government calls it in. Um, and similarly, that's the case if you're moving through one of the thresholds um, or you're requiring veto rights, but the target doesn't quite fall within the key sector definitions. So if you follow that route through the flowchart, you'll see you also end up at the blue box. Um, now, the government isn't going to care about most deals that fall into that category. Um, but if the target entity is is very close to the 17 key sectors, so it maybe doesn't quite fit the definitions, but it's nevertheless something that might be of interest to the government, then again, you might be asking yourself that question, should I um, go for voluntary 
notification. Obviously, if you've answered no to all of the questions, then then you're home free. Um, there there isn't even any uh, government jurisdiction uh, in that case. Um, and obviously, in in most cases, uh, if it's a, a an entity that or an asset that has absolutely no potential national security implications, then um, you're you might end up in the in the blue box. Um, but you're not gonna you're not gonna do anything from an NSI perspective because there there simply won't be the risk. Um, but again, the, the most important thing is understanding whether you're in that red box because if you are, you have to notify. Um, so moving on from the flowchart and just mentioning one thing that has uh, by, is by no means insurmountable but has occasionally been a challenge. And this is the question of how you calculate the shares or voting rights for the purposes of those questions we've just covered. And in particular, the circumstances in which you might need to aggregate um, one uh, one set of shares or voting rights with some other set of shares or voting rights. Um, and there, there are various uh, ways in which uh, rights and interests can be uh, either acquired or held. So if two parties hold an interest jointly, it will be attributed to both of them. Uh, equally, so not. I don't mean split in half. I mean they'll each have, um, you know, if you have joint shareholding um, of twenty five percent of the shares, each party will be deemed to have the whole twenty five percent. You can have indirect holdings through a nominee or through the majority stake in a subsidiary company um, related to that through connected persons per the Companies Act definition. Um, if you have the right to control or veto someone else's actions, then you will be taken to. Uh, have control of the rights or interests that that person has. Um, options are interesting. So if uh, if a party acquires an option to acquire, let's say, 30% of shares in a qualifying entity, and they are able to trigger that option at will, um, then they will be taken to have uh, acquired that 30% at the point they obtain the option, not at the point they exercise the option. So that should be notified. If it needs to be notified, that should be notified before the option agreement is uh, is finalised. Um, you then have vaguer concepts of joint agreement and shared common purpose. So that's essentially where two parties are so sort of closely entwined with each other, even if they have no formal sort of legal relationship with each other, but they've kind of agreed that they'll they'll vote their shares in the same way on more or less all matters and they predetermined how those votes should go, or if they're basically pursuing this vague notion of a common purpose um, where they uh, and and you wouldn't say you wouldn't include in that, you know, two parties who both want the business to be a success. It, it would have to be something uh, something beyond that. Um, so just be conscious of aggregation issues when you're looking doing that calculation. Um, moving on. And uh, Jamie. Thanks, Charles. Um, so yeah, the as we've mentioned, um, mandatory notification kicks in in certain circumstances. And one of the requirements um, for that is that the uh, qualifying entity, the the target, um, is active in one of these 17 key sectors of the economy, which are essentially designated as those that have the highest potential risk of things going wrong if companies active in these areas get into the wrong hands. Um, so I've, I've had, a, you'll see, I've had a wee bit of fun with the clip art here. Um, I don't propose to go into a great deal of depth on any of these. I think the main thing really to um, to flag here is that these are often quite complex um, definitions of these sectors and they don't necessarily, what, what is inside the tin is not necessarily what you would think just from reading the outside of the tin. Um, so just to take a couple of examples of that, I mean, defence is, 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 is kind of obvious if the target is has contracts um, with the Ministry of Defence or with somebody who has contracts with the Ministry of Defence, then that can come into play. But some of them can be a, be a wee bit more challenging. Um, advanced materials involves a very lengthy and complicated list of um, scientific definitions, um, which essentially everybody is in the hands of the experts when it comes to defining whether a given entity falls within that category. The same is very true for things like synthetic biology. We've done quite a few in that area where um, it, it really is important to precisely pin down the nature of 
of, of, of research or manufacturing that is taking place and how that works. <clears throat> um, things like energy um, operate really by reference to certain types of licensed or licensable activities. Um, if, if you're a, an electricity um, generator or um, transmitter, then you um, will be caught by those definitions. But for example, uh, an electricity supply licensee is not because supply is not seen as falling into the same category of sensitive high risk area. Um, transport is a category that by its name you might think covers all sorts of things, but it's it's really about ports and airports. Again, a focus on sort of critical national infrastructure um, and, and then things like critical suppliers to government, suppliers to the emergency services and indeed the definition of data infrastructure. All of these are really tying to specific types of public body that contracts are with. And one thing that I think we often come back to when we're um, speaking to um, buyers, sellers, targets about whether the activity of a target falls into one of these critical sectors, as well as reading it inside the definitions and really going into that, um, a, a useful rule of thumb is even if you don't think that you fall into any of these on the face of it, um, any government contract is worth having a think about um, because there might be something um, relevant somewhere in that. So those are um, the sort of headlines of those sectors. Um, so some some rules of thumb when it comes to approaching how to assess whether a target is captured by one of those. I mean, the, the, the prudent thing to do really is to assume the widest possible interpretation of that high level sector description. Is there any possibility, does anything that the target does sound like it might fall within that? Um, and if it, there's any possibility, if if there's some, if the word biology should be enough to trigger you just to look inside the tin and see what precisely falls within that definition, rather than just um, assuming that because you or the target doesn't call the activity what the 17 sector names do, um, just can't really assume that you don't fall within it. It is important to really second guess that and, and look inside in more detail. Um, within that then, really adopting the most conservative interpretation of any potentially relevant definitions. So um, looking inside things like the definition of um, research into synthetic biology, um, the, the, my favorite example, um, you know, really asking yourself, well, is there any potential that I'm caught? Am, am, I, am I clearly falling outside the definition that's here? Am I clearly falling within um, something that is, is stripped out of the definition of synthetic biology or satellite and space technology or advanced materials or whatever it is? Or am I not quite sure? Because in that not quite sure category, when we're talking about control of entities in the 17 sectors, it's so important to get it right that adopting that low risk approach, that prudent approach to whether you're caught by a definition is really the best thing to do. There's, there's a lot more that goes wrong by assuming wrongly that you're not caught than by assuming wrongly that you are. Um, there is guidance available. Um, it is moderately useful, but we have noted a few times where where we've not entirely been sure that the the guidance hasn't perhaps suggested um, a reading of the legislation that the legislation itself might not might not suggest. So it is important to bear in mind that the the legislation itself, in terms of the NSI Act, but but more importantly, in terms of the notifiable acquisition regulations, which define all of these sectors in a great deal of detail, it's important to start with those. Those are the those are the legally binding definitions of whether in not notifying something, you may be committing a criminal offence um, or may be exposing a business to significant fines. So the legislation is the key thing. The guidance can help around that. But where the two clash or where you think, well, that doesn't quite, it's not quite how I read it, then it's really about um, the definitions that are set out in the regulations. And then beyond that, really the, the key thing is to seek advice in any areas of ambiguity. Um, there's 
the, the guidance can sometimes suggest exemptions that don't really exist. The guidance can sometimes suggest a reading that isn't necessarily um, the right one. Um, and the legislation itself, particularly the regulations, are very lengthy and very complicated. And so um, really both, both legal but also technical advice, um, I think, is really useful. Moving on. Um, mandatory notification and the consequences of failing to comply to, to, to comply with that. Um, well, the key thing is a notifiable deal is uh, void if it completes without approval. Um, we don't really know what we mean by void there yet. Um, we know it's legally unenforceable um, in terms of completing the deal. Um, but what else does it mean? For example, are other provisions in the um, in the um, contract still enforceable, such as warranties and so on? Are they any use at all, um, given the void nature of the deal? Um, there are criminal sanctions, as I've mentioned, um, both for companies and directors and management for completing um, without a reasonable excuse. Um, nobody wants to go to prison for five years for misunderstanding the definition of synthetic biology um, and unlimited fines um, as well. So there, this is a high risk area. In addition, um, civil penalties of uh, the high up to the higher of five percent of global group turnover or ten million pounds, so um, potentially quite significant financial cost in this as well. Albeit, as of the latest report, um, as of March twenty twenty three, there have been no such um, penalties issued, and that might be an indication that people are getting this right. It might be an indication that people have a reasonable excuse when they get it wrong. It might be an indication that there has been a bit of forbearance from the Investment Security Unit and Secretary of State so far while this all beds in. Um, Non-notifiable acquisitions, by which I mean anything that is an acquisition caught by the Act, which is not mandatory. Um, the government can call in for review. So any deal where a person gains control of a qualifying entity or a qualifying asset, going back to a um, point Charles was making earlier, um, any of those can be called in if the Secretary of State thinks there is a potential national security risk. So what do you mean by control of qualifying entity? Well, all of those crossing of thresholds that we talked about in the flow chart a moment ago, plus um, at, at where the transaction provides the acquirer with material influence over the policy of the target that they didn't have before. Qualifying assets, acquisition of qualifying assets are covered as well within this. So um, as, as we picked up on a moment ago, that can cover pretty much anything. The acquisition of land, acquisition of movable property and the acquisition of um, intellectual property, ideas, trade secrets, data. Um, designs, software, really anything. And, and that's been something that a lot of, for example, universities have had to grapple with recently and, and how that affects transactions and licenses that they might enter into. Um, what do we mean by control of an asset? Really just acquiring a right or interest in it that allows the acquirer to direct or control how it's used, um, including where they already have that ability and they're getting more of it. And then in terms of the outcomes of a call-in notice, um, well, the one that I always like to get on my desk is called a final notification. Um, the, that is essentially, uh, you're good to go. There is no problem with this. Um, there are no further complications. You don't need to talk to us again. Um, that's the good one. The other one is a final order. And a final order can take different forms. Um, a final order is where there is a risk to national security established by the Secretary of State. Um, and that can either block the deal entirely or it can impose um, other requirements in order to remedy that risk. So divestment of some parts of the acquired entity, um, restrictions on what the target or acquirer can do with the assets that have been acquired or the information or data or anything else, um, obligations concerning how existing contracts um, have to be run and used and how the board has to be made up, maybe the appointment of um, external directors or independent directors. Um, there, there is um, scope for the Secretary of State to provide financial assistance in consequence of this type of um, requirement, um, you know, where it perhaps financially hits the company, um, but we've not seen that used yet either. And whether that's an indication that, um, that it's not been seen as necessary or it's just um, 
because times are tough. We don't know. Charles. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so I mentioned at the start that we'd be talking about the first one and a quarter years um, of the Axe operation. That's because what we're doing here is we're um, drawing out some stats from um, the uh, government's annual reports on the operation of the NSIA. Uh, an annual report for the government means a report against the government's financial year, which is to the end of March. So the first report was from the Act coming into force in January 2022 until March 2022. So we only have Q1 there. We've since had a full year of operations so up to the end of March, and you can see the comparison of the stats there. So in terms of the number of notifications received, um, 222 in the first quarter. If you, annual, if you annualize that, 888 is actually smaller than we ended up with in the first full year, um, which is slightly surprising because I had expected uh, that it would be the other way around on the basis that as the Act was coming into force, there would have been deals that uh, the parties were able to accelerate so that they completed, that they would ordinarily have completed in January, let's say 22, they would have accelerated them to complete them in December. And so they didn't have to notify them. Um, so I did expect that number to have been artificially depressed. Turns out, no, um, that's maybe going to be about typical. We'll see what happens in the next report. Um, bit of a shift in the ratio of mandatory to voluntary notifications. Um, so from 88% uh, and 11%, uh, you've gone to 71% and 21%. So there's obviously been a shift in uh, the number of parties deciding that a voluntary notification is a is a sensible idea. Um, retrospective notification, that's where a deal that should have been notified completed without having been notified. Um, so as Jamie said, th there haven't actually been any um, penalties issued for this. Um, we were actually responsible for one of those 15 um, through no fault of our own, I should say. Um, but uh, yeah, no penalties issued so far, but 15 deals that are known about that completed when they really shouldn't have. Um, in terms of the number of notices that are rejected um, by the ISU, um, so 3.6% up to 5% the end of March, usually uh, the government says that the, the usual reason for that is having used the wrong form. So saying that something's a voluntary notification when in fact it's within the mandatory regime. So you can't, you do need to work out which regime you're in. You can't just say, well, we might be in mandatory, but even if we're not, we'll voluntarily notify it. You need to use the right form or it'll be rejected and you won't get your clearance. So you do need to, to understand which regime you're actually in. Um, in terms of uh, the number of deals called in, um, there were 17 called in in the first quarter. Uh, there were 65 called in in the full year. Um, the the Again, the ratios are, are interesting. So you had 13 uh, of the 196 notifications were called in. So that's 6.6% of all the mandatory notifications um, or or roughly there's there's a, obviously a time lag where a notification might come in within one period a call in happens within another but roughly speaking 16% um, of voluntary notifications although that's probably a bit skewed by being a small number um, five just over 5% of mandatory notifications result in a call in um, much higher coming up on 10% of voluntary notifications. I suppose that's to be expected because the majority of mandatory notifications are formally caught by the regime but are never going to create any risk. Whereas if you are voluntarily notifying something, it's because you've identified that it might be of interest and it might be at risk of being called in. So it's not surprising that that number is higher. And then own initiative deals. So these are deals that were not notified to the government, but the government became aware of them and said, we want to take a look at that. So there were none in the first quarter, but then there were 10 in the, the full financial year. Um, there were no final orders made in the first quarter. Again, there were deals called in, but those hadn't found their way through the process in time for that reporting period. So all of the final orders um, for the full one and a quarter years happened in uh, the year to March 2023. There were 15. Um, so that's 25% of uh, the the deals that were called in, more or less. Um, and of those, one third of the final orders resulted in a deal being blocked. So again, almost 8% of deals that were called in ended up being blocked altogether. Um, so you can get a picture there of some of the uh, some of the um, the sort of scale of the regime.
Um, we then have stats on timings, which are interesting from a kind of a deal planning perspective. Um, so the first step when you submit a notification is it gets reviewed by the investment security unit, which is in the cabinet office, and they decide whether it contains everything it needs to contain. Um, and uh, they've slowed down a little bit on that. So it was three to four working days for mandatory, four to five for voluntary in the first quarter. Um, for the full year, it was four to five working days. They've set themselves a, a target. It's not a statutory target, but an operational one of five working days. Um, and that tends to comport with our own experience. They've been coming back in around that time period to start. And that's when they start their formal clock of 30 working days for the initial review. Um, if they reject a notice, then it takes a bit longer for obvious reasons, because they've been sort of going over it and puzzling about whether it actually contains what they need. Um, so you don't really want your notice to be rejected, and you definitely don't want it rejected if you're up against a tight completion deadline. Um, Neither report says how long it takes from acceptance to clearance at that first review stage. So that's essentially a no further questions response. Um, so we don't know what the average is, but both reports said that all notifications made to the ISU were either cleared or called in within the 30 working day time limit. Um, again, that's consistent with our experience, but from our own experience and from speaking to others who deal with this sort of work, generally you should be budgeting the full 30 working days. You might get it back on day 27, 28, 29. Um, other than some, I think, freak occurrences, you're not going to get something back in 10 or 15 days. Um, if something is called in, then uh, as of March, you were looking at 27 to 28 working days for that decision to be made for mandatory 25 to 27 for voluntary, not much difference. Um, once it has been called in, if you get the good outcome, the final notification, which sounds bad, it sounds like you're going to be evicted, but it is actually the good one. Um, so it was 24, but again, that slowed down 25 to 31 working days and 31 that's over the the statutory limit of 30 working days, but that can be extended by the secretary of state or by agreement. Um, where you have a final order, those processes have taken a lot longer, unsurprisingly, 77 to 81 working days on average. Um, so that uh, that is going to be parties agreeing to extend the period in the hope of persuading the Secretary of State not to make the order. That's why it's taking that long. Um, Moving on then to unpacking some of those uh, final orders. So um, there were 15 made in that period. Um, there have been uh, three, uh, three made since. Um, sorry, uh, two made sense. Um, that, the maths there don't quite add up. Um, five deals have been blocked. Um, so the first one that was blocked, Beijing Infinite Vision, that was licensing of assets from the University of Manchester in relation to vision sensing technology. As the name suggests, that's a Chinese business. Um, the second one, uh, Pulsic, is a, a software provider that facilitates the manufacturing of semiconductors. So recurring theme semiconductors, again, a Chinese buyer um, that was blocked. The Probably the most famous one, Nexperia, uh, wanting to buy Newport Wafer Fab. Again, ultimately Chinese owned Nexperia. Um, that was called in by the government on a retrospective basis. So act after it had completed prior to the act being passed, um, there's was, there was power for the government to do that. And the government ordered that that be unwound. Then highlight research uh, being bought by or wanted to be bought by a Chinese semiconductor company. Uh, highlight is a UK manufacturer of components that was blocked. And then the last one isn't Chinese. Uh, it's Russian. That's kind of the next next on the list of highest risk, probably. So up as a um, regional broadband provider um, and uh, the the acquirer there had bought it but was ordered to be unwound the acquirer was owned by a number of sanctioned russian oligarchs um so that you know that's that should be tripping the alarm bells if if you're looking at that deal um so again also retrospective and also unwound um in uh the year to march 23 there were 10 others that were not blocked but were made subject to conditions um behavioral conditions including things like obligations to maintain supply and uk capabilities to keep certain information secure the sorts of things that jamie mentioned might be done in a, a final order um we then got uh since that reporting period we've had two more behavioral um interventions uh those are um voice uh, so Voice is a Canadian company, um, which which I think illustrates that even though the 
deals that have been blocked outright have been, you know, Chinese and Russian buyers where you might expect um, the the conditional clearances. Um, and in the Voyas case, it was acquiring undersea imaging assets from the University of Southampton. We don't actually know what the asset is or if it was a license or a purchase or whatever. Um, but uh, uh, one of the interesting things there is that Voyas was required to uh, carry out enhanced customer diligence and to report to the government on who it was that was actually acquiring this technology. Um, and then EDF, obviously French, um, acquiring certain businesses from GE that were used in uh, the production of naval propulsion systems for the Royal Navy. Um, Again, there were behavioral controls there, but an interesting one is that the state, the order gave the state step in rights to ensure continued supply um, if necessary. So al although we had um, eight of the 15 orders in 2023 had Chinese buyers, um, four of them were UK, three of them were US. Um, so, uh, you know, you do, there are risks, there are greater risks if you're talking about Chinese, Russian, et cetera. But it is the regime is formally agnostic as to nationality. And you may I think we're seeing a bit of a trend that the government is to some extent using the act um, is taking the opportunity the act presents to gain closer control over key suppliers. So particularly in defense and things like that. So even if it's a UK buyer, they might not be concerned about the buyer themselves, but the act gives them the opportunity to require the business to ensure continued supply, that sort of thing. Um, so there's, I think there's an element of, of strategy going into some of those orders and not just purely a risk assessment. Um, but I'll move back to Jamie now. Yep. And just really to cover off um, some of the themes that, that that we've seen, um, both both from our own experience and and also as Charles says from some of the broader picture, I mean at that point just just there, um, about the the formal agnosticism of the regime, but really in practice, um, we we do see um higher risk the more um we're talking about um, buyers from, um sort of higher risk countries, um, and also um, where buyers have more of a government presence um, in terms of their own ownership structure um, is, is something that has been of interest, whether that is, you know, governments um, w within friendly countries or not as well. Um, the, the, the obligation the, the, the offence of not doing this um, is on the, the acquirer, but really we're talking about a shared risk between buyers and sellers because no um, seller wants their deal to fall through, particularly when they're looking at particular time frames um, that they want to achieve a transaction by. So um, it's really in everybody's interests to work together very closely um, to get all the information together, to get the submission in, in a place where it will be accepted in good time. Um, really seen the emergence of pretty standard um, due diligence questions, warranties and conditions precedent when it comes to reflecting the risks of um, complying or not complying with the NSI Act. And these things sort of finding their way into deals pretty much as standard now in the same way as any sort of merger control type um, conditions precedent or, or warranties do. Um, really important to risk assess potential acquirers, particularly if if a, a target business is being touted to different potential buyers, um, you know whether we're talking mandatory or we're talking voluntary, um, there there is you know at best a risk of calling, um, and it's important to that any potential seller of a business understands that some potential buyers are going to be at higher risk either of being blocked entirely or of having the transaction subjected to um, to particular conditions. So that's something really to take into account from the get-go. Um, it was previously the case, um, well, it's still technically the case, that um, Scottish share pledges where um, where the, the control of shares in effect transfers with security over those shares um, was caught by NSI Act. Um, essentially because there there was that change of ownership involved. We've now got the Movable Transactions Act, which creates an, an alternative route, essentially, to um, security over shares in Scotland. So uh, it will no longer be the case going forward that any security over shares in Scotland, particularly when we're talking about um, the mandatory notification areas, um, is going to create this additional um, burden 
burden of having to comply with all of this regime. Um, reorganizations, um, family transfers, tax efficiency arrangements, all of these things, um, they are subject to this if they meet the thresholds if and mandatory if they're in the sectors. And it's really important to recognize that um, if there's a plan to do any sort of internal rearrangement or tax efficiency arrangement before, say, a sale of a business, that that is all done in good time and takes into account the need to comply with this regime um, to the extent that it applies. Um, and then really that that last point there about the, the black box nature of this. Um, I, I lost count of the number of sort of happy final notifications I have, but I really couldn't tell you what it was about the um, forms that we submitted that um, meant that there was no concern um, other than I just knew that there was no concern because ISU does not give us its reasons. We can't speak to anybody about it, can't speak to anybody during the process um, either, um, which means it's particularly important to make sure that you're you're sure that everything you've given is everything you can give because there's very, very little room for um, back and forth. And if anything's missing, you just get told to resubmit. You don't get um, to engage in any sort of conversation with a human being. So um, it is a bit of a tricky process to navigate, but um, one that requires having everything ready. And I think we're on to questions. Yep, thanks, Jamie. Um, so I've got got some questions to answer. Um, probably got time for one or two more. So if you have one, get it submitted. Um, while we're answering those, you can see the details. There are some upcoming um, webinars we're running that might be of interest to you. Um, so one question, uh, I think, Jamie, you probably just answered this in an acquisition who's responsible for the notification, the buyer or the seller. So is the buyer who's responsible in the sense that if it completes without being notified, the buyer is the person who's liable to the criminal offence, the civil penalty, etc. Um, but the, it's, it is very much not in the seller's interest for the deal to be void, because um, what that that can surely only mean that you are still the owner of the thing that you thought you had sold, um, which uh, you know even if you are also in possession of the money at the same time, um, that is going to create uh, a, an unsustainable situation that will be difficult to resolve. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, uh, and in terms of what goes into the notification, um, there needs to be a lot of information about the buyer, a lot of information about the target which the seller may need to provide. And there also need to be some information about the seller in terms of the pre-acquisition structure. So the seller doesn't get to just sort of wash their hands of it. Um, I'll take uh, next question, which is just asking about um, the most common uh, sectors uh, that are that are in of interest to the government. So the, the government's latest annual report um, has figures for the, the percentage of call-in notices that are attributable to um, particular uh, key sectors within our list of 17. So the most common is military and dual use. So that featured in, it looks like just over 35% um, of call-in notices um, with defense and advanced materials at just under 30%. Um, and it's then, a, it's then a pretty big drop um, to uh, act somewhat surprisingly perhaps satellite and space technology um, which is around 12 percent um, and computing hardware and ai i think 11 um, and then you kind of kind of tail off a bit so a little bit under 10 percent. you've got energy data infrastructure critical suppliers to um, the uh, government um, and communications uh, and then and then after that you're into kind of you know five percent and below um, and similarly, in terms of uh, just expanding on what I said about um, the location of buyers, so there are stats on what the government calls origin of investment. So in terms of the percentage of call-in notices, more than 40% the origin of investment was China. So that kind of reinforces what we were saying. Um, although uh, the, the, next, the next highest number is UK. So UK investment accounted for over 30% of call-in notices. Um, then the USA at 20, Canada are at around 15, um, and then everyone else is is below 10%, France, Israel, Australia, Japan. Um, so uh actually of the top of the top 10, um, I think you have you have China first, um, but then everybody else is is what you would call a friendly country until you get down to Russia at one at around 10. Um so uh 
uh, yeah, there there is um, there's obviously a, there's a very different degree of risk depending on the origin of investment, but uh, there, it's by no means uh, you're, you're by no means home free just because you're a British buyer, for example. Um, there's then a question about uh, atomic fusion energy. Does that ring bells for a sector? Jamie, do you want to take that and then we'll wrap up? Yeah, um, I mean, it probably depends on the specifics of it, and I get why you wouldn't want to tell us what those are, particularly on a webinar. Um, there, it, Generally speaking, I mean, civil nuclear is one of the broader categories, um, and that kind of really the, the focus of that is on um, is on sort of licensed civil nuclear activities. So if we're talking about um, anything in that category, if on the other hand, we're talking about a more sort of basic level of research, then you're probably in the realms of things like um, things like advanced materials um, or um, or dual use um, type categories of items um, as, as well as there's obviously the energy category um, if you if you're potentially falling in there so um, yeah nuclear fusion is one of those things that makes me think there's probably something somewhere that catches it um, but precisely what will depend on the precise activity we're talking about yeah, and I think even if it's not caught by um, the mandatory regime, uh, just just the words "atomic fusion" uh, make me think that if there's any uh, if there's any deal involving that, that's going to be called in if it's not notified. So that's very much yeah. high on the voluntary notification um, priority list, I think. Um, okay, uh, so thank you for the questions. Thank you for your attendance. Um, I think the final slide. Uh, just has our um, contact details. Um, so do get in touch if you if you want the flowchart, if you have any questions, anything like that. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.